Greetings class and welcome to another session here for uh, Second Language Acquisition Studies. Uh, today we're going to be talking about human learning and how that is uh, different from other kinds of learning, how we actually think. We'll talk a little bit about behaviorism and and uh, some of the things that have come off of behaviorism. Uh, we'll talk about uh, the different types of learning, a little bit of uh, uh, delving into this uh, idea of humanistic learning and then we're also going to talk about some of the impact of that. Uh, in particular, the uh, the audio lingual method. Let's jump right in here and uh, start talking about some of the basic things. How does man learn? Or I'm sorry, how do humans learn? The PC. Uh, how do we learn? What's the process that we do when we're learning? Uh, really, is a question that I I wanted to pose to you. And if we were face to face, I'd have you sit there and think about it. How is it that we learn? How is it that we understand things? How is it that we acquire this new information? Uh, now, for some people, uh, they, they may say they learn by watching. Others, they say they learn by reading or they learn by doing. Others learn by hearing. Um, and those are generally through the senses um, uh, that people learn. But when you look at the history of uh, this whole concept of studying how people learn, uh, we go back to the hard scientists who are looking at something called a uh, stimulus response type of ideas. <clears throat> um, so when we're looking at learning, we actually need to be thinking about uh, what it is that this, uh, you know, conditioned or the stimulus response type of thing had done. Now, if you're going to be teaching anybody, um, you, let's, for example, you're going to be teaching your dog. You're going to be teaching, uh, that'd be the best one. You'll be teaching your dog to do something. Obviously, you have to know what he knows, one. You have to know the goal to where you want to go, two. You need a method for getting there to that goal, and then you need some form of assessment to ensure that it's gotten there. So you need these four things. The same thing will be true for language teaching. What do my students already know? Where do I want them to go? What method am I going to use to get them there? And how am I going to verify that they actually did this, you know, those four steps? And that's typical for any type of uh, learning scenario. Um, so that's if you're going to set up a system, okay? Now, scientists begin to investigate, you know, learning, I guess you could say. And one of the most uh, traditional is this whole idea of uh, stimulus response. And I'm assuming that you guys all know about Pavlov and his dogs <clears throat> and how they had uh, stimulus response. They had a conditioned response and they had unconditioned responses. Um, but the point that you want to make here is that you have some form of condition that spurs a response. Um, and whether the condition uh, is, or, or whether the response is, uh, you know, trained or untrained, whether the, whether the the stimulus is uh, known or unknown, well, the point is that you have some stimulus and you have some response. Okay. Now, uh, that's that's um, Pavlov there with his dogs. Okay. Then you move on to B. F. Skinner, who talks about operant conditioning. And that's where you have a stimulus type response type of thing, but you also have this in a higher order where um, where the, the objective or the reward is itself a way to help learn and spur on learning. Um, so um, this is where you have an operant that's doing some conditioning, but it's conditioning you in such a way that you're going to acquire this new information. Um, Basically, what happened here is that Skinner took Pavlov's ideas and he tried to apply it to uh, thinking or behavioral modifications in humans. Uh, so it wasn't just the stimulus that brought on the response, but the response also brought on uh, a reward type of thing. Uh, we don't need to go much more into um, Skinner uh, other than to say that he wanted to encourage good uh Response, uh, good conditioning uh, by giving positive, uh, positive feedback, positive uh, rewards. Um, and so he thought it would not be good to have negative rewards, although there were times where that would be necessary. Uh, following him is Ausubel's uh, subsumption theory, and this is more in line with uh, more modern day thinking with regard to learning, and that is that you, you hook on to existing knowledge, new information. And uh, so, as the quote here is, to, subs 
to subsume is to incorporate new materials into one's cognitive structures. From Ostrobel's perspective, this is the meaning of learning when we take new information that's plugged into or hooked into existing information. Uh, kind of like uh, the I plus one type of principle, if you're familiar with Krasha. When information is subsumed into the learner's cognitive structures, it is organized hierarchically. Um, and so um, hierarchical learning is going to be better. Hierarchical learning means that you categorize or you organize information in some meaningful fashion. Um, uh, so instead of having just random pieces of information that you memorize or that you learn, that you yeah, that you memorize, you organize information in such a way that it uh, has a more meaningful uh, elements or more of a meaningful aspect. Um, also, Bell compares. Um, rote memorization with meaningful learning. He gives the example of learning an address versus learning a phone number. And you'll note that learning an address has a variety of components in it, in it the name, the street address, the city, state, and zip. And that generally speaking, it's easier to memorize those, even though it's more complex, because it's got an interrelationship between the parts, whereas a phone number has less of an interrelationship. So it's harder to learn. It's easier to forget, which we'll talk about in just a second here. Um, but also Bell says that rote learning isn't nearly as good. You lose more parts, you forget more parts. I, I don't know the answer to my next question here, but I always I'm, I wonder about these the whole idea of Chinese characters. Just to let you know, um, every human learns language basically at the same speed, at the same rate. So kids, by the time they're two or three years old, they're speaking whatever language it is that they're learning. Uh, by four and five, they have a, you know basically a rough control over over their language, You'll, even though they're still developing some of the finer parts of their grammar and obviously learning vocabulary. That's going to be a while. But people who use Chinese characters, right, the, 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 the Chinese, the Japanese, the Korean, they spend an inordinate amount of time learning all these characters. Typical Japanese student will learn almost 2,000 characters by the time they graduate from high school. So all through those first uh, 17, 18 years of life, they are spending a great deal of time learning their letters, as it were, learning these characters, because they're not the same. English, uh, 26 letters. Uh, Spanish, uh, you know, what, 30 letters. But uh, Chinese, they have four or 5,000 characters that they have to memorize. The amount of time it takes them to do, well, how do they do that? They do that via rote. <laughs> this is exactly what Alcibel says. It's not meaningful. Now, the characters themselves do have meaning, but the way that they learn is to learn. They write these characters a hundred times uh, until they get them memorized. And I don't know if they actually do well in keeping them and then using them later on. Uh, I don't know if we would consider that uh, meaningful learning, but I do find it interesting that uh, we in this culture have thrown away rote learning as something that's quote-unquote not good, and yet I see rote-type systems being used to learn all these Chinese characters, and the uh, the literacy rate in, in Korea, Japan, and China is extremely high. So maybe there's something to it. Again, I don't know for sure, but that's just thoughts that I have in my head. Uh, okay, the next thing that also about talks about is systematic forgetting. And what he means by that is the brain's ability to throw away, to get rid of things that it deems un, unusable or unnecessary. Uh, the brain does try to organize itself, and any things, any types of memories or things that it deems unuseful, uh, that it deems uh, not unuseful, n not used very often. Okay? If it's minimally used, it's not going to have as near as many connections to it, so it's going to die off. Um, figuratively speaking, it's going to die off. And the system, uh, your brain, systematically gets rid of those things because it's not using them. Um, so that's what they mean by systematic forgetting. You begin to, um, the brain begins to, you know, snip off these extra pieces that aren't being used very often, kind of like when you're... Uh, uh, pruning a plant, you know, and you, you're snipping off the dead pieces that aren't being used very often. That's the idea here of systematic forgetting. And that does happen. We do forget things because it's we didn't place it in importance. It's not meaningful to us in a certain sense. All right, let's move on to uh, Rogers, I'm sorry, Rogers' uh, uh, humanistic psychology. He... <clears throat> 
studied um, more of the affective elements of of uh, learning more than the cognitive. And Rogers believed that people have the ability to adapt and grow. Okay, fully functioning people, however, should be at peace with their feelings. Now, first time I read that, I have to admit I had to laugh because I don't know a lot of people that are at peace with their feelings. We all have struggles internally. Uh, his idea here, though, is that we need to be, um, what's the word? We need to be, for lack of a better word, nice, encouraging. Um, uh, <laughs> not strict, not uh, have a feeling of uh, superiority, not um, uh, uh, difficult, not, uh, uh, what's the word here? So it's going to be nice and puppy and sweet and let's encourage and can't we all get along type of, uh, of learning and teaching. Um, and some of that I would agree with, some of it I wouldn't agree with. Uh, you want to have the advantages of both sides. You need the carrot and the stick, according to, according to me, according to uh, Tuzi here. Anyway, how does this impact education? Well, does it mean that we're a facilitation of learning? Are we facilitating learning instead of actually, you know, cutting somebody's head open and pouring in the information? Okay. No, we don't want to have it that way. We want to have more of a, of a two-way relationship where we're both uh, getting involved here in the learning process. Uh, learning how to learn is more important than being taught by a superior. In other words, just dumping that information into your head is, is not nearly as important as learning how to learn. It goes back to the old concept or the old adage, um, um, it's better to teach a man how to fish than to give him a fish. You give a man a fish, he gets to eat for a day. You teach a man how to fish, and he can eat for uh, the rest of his life. So learning how to think, learning how to learn is more important. Um, and that you as the as the teacher should not lord it over your students uh, but instead you should work in conjunction work with them uh, to develop some style of learning um, now in a classroom who has who has control who should have control um, and uh, so Rogers is going to say well it should be it should be a dual nobody should be in charge of anything in fact there are some schools, small though they are, uh, where students decide what they want to study. And they can study anything that they want. They set the curriculum. Uh, obviously, that's not the public school system, but there are certain schools out there where uh, that can be done. Uh, okay, Who has control? Who should? Uh, and that's a concern that he's going to have in the book. Um, my, my thoughts here are that, um, of course, the um, the teacher should be in control, hands down, not an issue. Um, but that doesn't mean that I need to lord it over my students. I don't need to have the superior type of mentality. My opinion, a good teacher is going to be someone who doesn't need to show his hand. He doesn't need to show that he's the boss. He doesn't need to uh, force things on his students, Okay, provided that, of course, the students want to learn students who don't want to learn, I'm, now I've got to figure out some way to encourage them to learn. And that's probably the way I would look at it. Um, but ultimately, the teacher does have control. He's the one who's responsible if things get out of hand. He's the one that needs to protect uh, the students from each other. He's the one that has to, in some sense, protect the students from himself. He's the one uh, that needs to uh, manage the classroom. Students don't learn how to manage classroom. The teacher does. Uh, so who's in control? That's a given, in my opinion. Who should be in control? I would think that a good teacher does not want to lord it over them. The teacher wants students to learn. And so their goal should be, what is the best way that we can get them to learn? Go back to my favorite uh, story with regard to uh, learning and teaching, and that's uh, the one of Tom Sawyer, where he had to white, well, he had to paint the fence. He had to whitewash the fence. And uh, he didn't want to do it. It was a job he had to do. And some of his buddies come over and they start laughing at him. <laughs> you go to paint the fence. And he turns around and looks at them and says, oh, you don't understand. This is fun. Now, he's, he's conning them, okay, mind you. But he convinces them that painting the fence is fun. In fact, some of his buddies literally give him stuff so they can paint, okay? He's conned them so well into painting. 
I just love the story. Well, I mean, you know, eventually they figure out that he was conning him, but I just love how he convinces them that this is a good thing. And as I look at that, I think that's the role of a teacher. A teacher needs to get to a student and say, this is a good thing. It's fun to learn. It's good to learn. It's a good thing. How do I convince them to want to paint the fence? Okay. Another example you could use is uh, the, um, uh, the phrase, you know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Okay? And I worked with horses. Very true. I, can't, I can stuff his head into that water, water bucket. He's not going to drink if he doesn't want to. I can't force him to do it. However, I can put salt in his food. Okay? I put salt in his food and he eats the food and all of a sudden he wants to drink. And to me, that's the goal of a, of a teacher. Okay? I want to convince them that this is a good thing to do. I would, I would have a stick if I need to. That horse is not being good. I may have to use that stick to make them do and go where I want them to. But I don't want to do that. I want to convince the horse that it's a good thing to drink the water. I want to convince the, the kids that it's a good idea to paint the fence. Uh, so if I can avoid the idea of superiority, I will. But ultimately, I have responsibility. Even in the classes I teach, if I'm teaching face-to-face, -face, which unfortunately we're not here, I would generally begin the whole course by asking, what do you, what do you want to get out of this course? Uh, what do you hope to learn? And then I want to take some of those ideas and try to incorporate them into the class so that you have some ownership in the class. Okay? Again, uh, this whole idea of... Uh, uh, control is one that, okay, there's a logical explanation for it. Yes, I'm in control because I have the, that responsibility. But I don't want to flaunt that. I want you to have fun with this. I want to convince you that this is a good thing. I want to convince you to participate. So, in that sense, I will be a facilitator, provided that you're a willing student. Now, how do I get you to be a willing student? Again, I've got to find ways to encourage you to say this is a good thing. Teachers should be facilitators, building relationships with students. And that, to me, is key. You build a good relationship with your students. So you, future, would be teachers. You go into a classroom and you start analyzing your students and you need to notice them. Notice how they're talking. Notice what they like, what they don't like. Notice what their issues are. And that way you can use those things that you notice to help them learn. Uh, noticing is going to be a big thing here. So, uh, anyway, is the facilitation of learning at one point? I would say yes. Um, of course, it'll depend on your students, right? Uh, if they're going to be difficult, you may need to pull out a, a some type of quote-unquote stick to get them to do uh, the right thing, but you wouldn't want to do that. So, in one sense, uh, Roger's, uh, you know, humanistic uh, psychology, I can understand where we want to make things nice. But in another sense, you know, I may want to convince them, yes, it's good to, you know, have pain, uh, it's good to uh, you know do things even though I don't like them. I, I remember years ago um, listening to Mary Lou Retton complain about her coach. Mary Lou Retton, for those of you who don't know, was an Olympic gold medalist in gymnastics, and she had won uh, a number of gold medals. And one day I'm watching a documentary, and she's fallen off the uneven bars, and she's bleeding from her lip or something, and her coach looks at her and says, get up, do it again. And I, I'm assuming she hated her coach at times, but it was because her coach was tough, right? This whole idea of superior, I don't know if he's superior, but he had control and he made her work. Sometimes pain is good. Sometimes this, you know, puppy, puppy, nice, let's all be friends type of thing is also good. But doesn't mean that we exclude the, the issues of being tough or strict or hard or having a high expectation, okay? Um, Roger's uh, humanistic. Uh, psychology. We move on from there to um, Paolo Fieri, who um, was concerned about uh, students being oppressed, and he wanted to empower them, the importance of empowerment, and giving them information so that they could be empowered to do things. Um, and although I understand some of the general concepts here, um, of, of giving students um, some power. Uh, I believe that there are some teachers who have taken this too far. 
Um, we want to give them freedom because we're giving them information. We want to give them uh, the ability to work within the class system because we want them to learn. We want to encourage them to do things. Okay. Uh, Friere argued that students should, should negotiate outcomes, that they should cooperate with the teacher in discovering learning. Okay. Uh, not defensive learning that protects them from failure, criticisms, competition, or punishment. Okay. So uh, the point here is that the, the students are going to be the ones that are making some of these decisions. They're going to be the ones involved in discovery. They get that power. Okay. And this was um, not traditional. Uh, this hap Freire came out with uh, these ideas in the 1970s. And so he wanted to empower his students. Um, and I, I don't even look at this as empowerment at all. I look at it more as um, ways to encourage students to grow. That's why I have uh, this piece listed down here. Language teachers uh, should uh, use meaningful communication that encourages the growth of the person. I want to encourage them to learn how to learn. I want to encourage them to learn how to be independent learners. Okay? But that doesn't mean that there aren't times where I want to protect, that I want to uh, you know, make sure that they do well so they don't get criticism or that uh, I don't have competition. Competition is a good thing. Uh, or some type of punishment if they're bad. Everybody who's bad gets some type of punishment. You work out in the business world. You're going to run into that as well. Um, so although I understand some of what Friari is saying here, I wouldn't agree with all of them because that's the way life is out there. Uh, you're going to be criticized out there. You're going to have competition out there. You're going to have punishment uh, out there if you do something that's out of line. Um, at the same time, I want to encourage them to play in the game. I want to encourage them to grow as a person. Uh, so there's a, a balance here that uh, we see. Uh, and so I, some of this I would agree with. Uh, the, the, the far out end where I'm giving students uh, power to, to rule what's going on, I would probably do less of. All right. Uh, we continue on with this idea of um, uh, human learning. Um, there are a number of uh, ways that we learn, and this is just uh, dealing, this is going from the low level to the higher levels. Signal response, there's some type of signal, and it causes uh, you to uh, learn, you, it causes you to understand something, that there's a, an issue or whatever, it's some type of signal that causes some type of uh, a response. And then you have stimulus response, which is more of what... Uh, um, Skinner was talking about, this is more of what Pavlov was talking about. This stimulus response is, is where not only do I have a stimulus, but I have a response that is greeted with some type of a reward and it, it helps to solidify that response. Chaining is nothing more than a, a series of stimulus responses that are all chained together so that we have some type of learning going. Again, we have some response and a reward, which causes another stimulus response and a reward. We chain these together type of thing. Verbal association, uh, according to um, according to Brown, is nothing more than taking a series of chained uh, is taking the idea of chaining only there with verbal associations. <clears throat> and uh, I think the way he describes it, it is. Let me just get to this real quick here. Um, the learning chains are verbal. Basically, the conditions resemble those of uh, you know the the chaining only instead of it just being a, some type of physical activity right like the dogs did uh, in Pavlov's it's a verbal associations where you can have like hello and then a response to that right uh, multiple discrimination is uh, you have a variety of, of ways that you can respond um, and so you have a stimulus rep uh, and a response in the verbal sense in the verbal association this is with multiple discrimination uh, but you can discriminate a variety of responses that are appropriate. Concept learning now goes higher above that, where you have all these different uh, chained verbal associations, but you can learn the whole general concept. You can learn all of these together in like one abstract idea, okay? And then a principle, okay, so we're, we're building one on top of another. A uh, principle is uh, having a group of concepts that you can put together and uh, understand the, these group of concepts as becoming a general principle. And then problem solving is, of course, problem solving, analyzing something and then trying to find a solution for it. Uh, these are all the different types of learning that you find in your behavioralistic uh, psychological researchers. Um, this is obviously going to have an impact on how we as uh, teachers 
and we as researchers look at second language learning, and especially these uh, these higher order ones, um, if indeed we're going to be looking at this in a strictly uh, hard scientific mode. Uh, I believe there are other ways that we do learn, but these are the ones that we're looking at that are that are uh, the more hard science type of learning. As we go on here with these types of learning, we have other types of uh, explanations as the way of describing how we learn. One is that we can learn from a transfer where we carry over a learned response, right? Um, so we transfer one idea, we transfer one ability, we transfer one concept from one space to another space. Um, so that, for example, when we learn to be polite at home and when we go outside, we transfer that idea outside to be polite outside the home. Um, and uh, the response that we get from that could be a good thing. It's a positive carryover. Uh, we carry something over from that other one. Now, negative transfer is when you have a carryover that's negative from one place and you carry that over to another place. Now, that's going to be negative transfer. It's going to be called interference. Um, and so you can have negative carryover as well. You also can have generalizations. Um, you assume that a rule works everywhere, and it doesn't necessarily work um, everywhere. There are words that you can say to uh, uh, some people that you can't say to others. Uh, just take, for example, your standard greetings. Uh, when you greet a friend, you may say, hey, yo, what's up? Um, but when you're speaking to the president of the college, you're probably not going to say, hey, yo, what's up? Um, there's a, a neat example that I saw about a little two-year-old boy uh, who uh, wasn't even two. He was maybe one. Uh, he was about two. And he was talking to uh, his family, and he learned this very impolite way of saying you. This is in Japanese, so I can't really translate this for you. But he was learned a very impolite way of saying it because he learned it from the other, I guess, boys in the area. And some nice elderly lady came to visit, and he used this word when speaking to her, and the parents were very apologetic. Right? He assumed that he could use that word everywhere, and he couldn't. Um, maybe not a good example. Here's a, here's a better example. There was a man who was uh, very good in Japanese, and he was being interviewed on a radio program. And uh, the, the radio uh, host asked him what he thought about uh, uh, some kind of food. You know, what did you think about uh, uh, sushi, for example? And this guy said, oh, I'm crazy for sushi. And immediately the radio host uh, said that he was, wanted to apologize for his guest because his guest didn't understand. <laughs> well, crazy was a word that was not appropriate to use even in public when talking about uh, well, we're talking about almost anything because it's a very uh, delicate, a very sensitive issue, and it's not something that you would put on the radio. Well, this guy didn't know this. We can use crazy in English uh, anywhere. You know, I'm crazy about that. I mean, I love it a whole bunch, right? But he he transferred this idea. He overgeneralized uh, an idea. So the idea that he thought was okay in, in uh, English didn't work in Japanese. Um, <laughs> another example of overgeneralization is the, the ED at the end of a sentence. Um, kids learn that ED is past tense, and then they try to use it everywhere. Right? I teached him how to do this. Well, that's an overgeneralization. Okay? So we have learning, but sometimes learning doesn't actually transfer the way we want it to. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. When it's bad, it's a, it's an interference. When it's good, it's a positive carryover. And when it's uh, overused, when it's used uh, more than it ought to be, it's an overgeneralization. We also learn in different modes. Um, we, have, um, we have inductive learning and deductive learning, right? Inductive learning is where we learn all the specifics and we move up to a, um, a main idea, a general concept. And we have deductive learning, where we have a general concept and we move down in to look at all the details. Okay, Top-down, bottom-up processing would be another way to call this. Um, and you know, we all reason this way. We can reason both ways. A good language learner is going to be able to do both. Okay, uh, We all probably have a preference. I don't know which one you would go from. Whether you feel more at ease looking at all the little details and then building up to the top, or starting with the general idea and then going down and looking uh, at all the components. Um, I don't know which one I do either. 
I think I know I do both, uh, and I know it's good as a language learner to do both. Uh, I wouldn't say one is better than the other. The if you can get to the objective, then good. Um, but it should be that if you're teaching language, that you try to encourage your students to be doing both. Um, because um, if they're trying to get to information and they can't do it one way, they can try to do it the other way. And I, in dealing with uh, with um, uh, Japanese, so the language that I uh, studied while I was overseas, uh, there were times where I tried I, I tried to understand the general concepts so that I can understand the details. And then there were times where I, so all I could understand were the details, and I was trying to build it up to get to the main idea. Um, so I would not say that one is better than the other. I would say that people have a preference. Some people prefer top down. Some people prefer um, the inductive, the bottom up uh, type of processing. Okay. So deductive is top down. Inductive is bottom up. Okay. Which is better? No, neither one is better. Both are are valuable. Uh, another element involved in language learning is this whole idea of language ability. I'm sorry, language aptitude. Um, the ability or knack to learn a language. Is there such a thing? Um, I believe most people would say yes. Um, I know some very intelligent people who have great difficulty in learning language. I typically tell people that anyone can learn language. My three-year-old kid can learn language. Anyone can learn language. And you're not going to be any smarter than any, or he's not going to be smarter than you. You should be able to do this. Now, having said that, I know of people that it's more difficult for them to learn language. Some people do have a knack. They have a, uh, um, a you know, they know how to use that black box in their head better, or they it, it functions more efficiently than in others. Um, we also have the fact that there are good language learners, and they have certain characteristics. And uh, those characteristics are, one, is they're, they're uh, risk takers. And they really are ones who are willing to take a risk. They're willing to try and do something. Uh, whereas other people are too afraid. They don't want to take a chance. You want to be a good language learner? Learn to take risks. Try something. Make a mistake. Even if people laugh at you. Um, a good language learner is one who takes risks. Good language learners are also ones that are good memorizers. Uh, when they need to learn a structure, they try to memorize that structure so that they could use it later on. Okay, so they're going to be ones who can memorize things uh, rather quickly. They're going to be good guessers. Uh, they're going to have the information, you know, they're going to have all these pieces, and they're going to try to put, push out there and try to uh, guess and, and hopefully do well. But they're going to be good guessers. They're going to live with ambiguity, and I love this one. Uh, wow, that's, that's harder to do that way, isn't it? Living with ambiguity. Um, living with, uh, yeah, well, I can't figure it out. No big deal. Little kids are that way all the time. You try to talk to them about uh, of the linguistics of something or the logic of something, and they don't, they don't, they don't care. They just want to tell you what they want to tell you, right? Oh, daddy, I ate some pischetti. No, honey, spaghetti. Yeah, I had some pischetti. No, dear, it's spaghetti. They don't care. They want to get their concept. Of, they're willing to not understand. Um, and when when you're trying to teach them something, they they don't care that 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 it that it's not some. That, forget about it. They'll learn it later. We as good language learners should be the same way. You don't understand something, you think, oh, it's beyond, forget about it. You'll, you'll come to it again. Um, a good language learner is not going to let themselves get all pressured and upset and frustrated because they can't understand something. Don't worry about it. You'll get it later. That's going to be a good language learner. Uh, good language learners are pragmatic. Uh, what is useful for me now? I want to study those things. In other words, I want to study things that are going to help me learn what I need to learn in order to get any objectives that I have done. Um, they're interpersonal. They reach out and talk with people. They interact. A good language learner is going to do that. They're going to be smart. Um, what kind of smart uh, means, uh, I'm not exactly sure. But what I do know is students who are bilingual generally do better on the SATs. Um, so there is some intelligence there. They're going to have some form of emotional stability. Um, people who are struggling with emotions are going to have far harder time learning language. Some issue that they have or, or something that makes them emotionally unstable, they're going to have a harder time. They need to have confidence or at least a drive to uh, attain. Um, 
I don't know how many students I've met who believe they can't succeed and therefore they don't even try. This self-fulfilling prophecy. You as a teacher want to instill in them the belief that they can succeed. You know, they can do it. Um, so uh, those are some of the elements of a, of, a, of a good language learner. As I said before, intelligence is one of those things. Uh, but intelligence in terms of language learning, one's linguistic and logical mathematical um, abilities would entail something called intelligence. Intelligence is also measured by how quickly one can learn. Well, that's your standard idea of an IQ. But then we come out with uh, Gardner's uh, multiple intelligences, and I'm assuming that you guys have studied this before uh, with all of the different ways that ones can learn. Uh, these include things like logical, musical, spatial, kinesthetic, um, interpersonal intelligences, okay? Um, and all up, you can be strong in some and weak in, in others. Um, and so, uh, generally, when we're talking about intelligence and language learning, we're probably separating the, the linguistic and logical mathematical abilities. Um, normally, we look at just logical and mathematical. Uh, but there is a connection to some form of there. Again, I said, you can be very intelligent in other areas and not have the, this knack, this aptitude for language learning. That being said, anybody can learn language. Anybody can learn language. All right. How does this play out in an actual um, language learning? We have all these theories of learning, right? We have uh, different ways in which people learn, and they're top down and bottom up, and and uh, the way they process and their intelligences. And how does this play out, or how did it play out in theories of of l learning and teaching a second language? Enter the audio lingual method. That's what ALM is going to stand for. The audio lingual method. The audio lingual method. Um, came about as a result of things like Skinner and uh, and um, I forget his name now Skinner and Ostebel and uh, and Rogers uh, ideas and the concept here was stimulus response stimulus response they did not focus on reading and writing they focused on listening and speaking Listening and speaking, listening and speaking, and there was, uh, it was it was set up primarily as uh, this way of, of uh, emphasizing, uh, you listen and you respond, you listen and respond. But eventually, it became to be this idea of uh, surface surface forms and wrote, uh, in some quote unquote meaningful fashion. The autolingual method is not used very much today, although I have to admit, part of Krashen is still here. Um, this type of learning uh, did not yield great numbers of bilingual people, uh, primarily because in order to move up in the ranks, you need to have uh, some focus on language. Uh, you need to have a focus on fluency, which is really what this is all hitting, the ability to communicate uh, in a free-flowing stream. But if you don't have a focus on grammar, a focus on building up your vocab, you know, your th four, five, six thousand word vocabulary, uh, you're not going to be able to become a bilingual speaker. And so this whole idea, the audiolingual method, is grounded in linguistic and uh, psychological theory, the stuff that we were just looking at. You're basically your stimulus response, your subsumption theory, your I plus one, and... Uh, it's, very, it's not used nearly as much anymore because we see the deficiency of it. I had a professor analyzing a, a French class, and the students in the class were not allowed to write anything down. This one student, is he's writing on his genes. You know, he's, he's writing the words down because he wants to be able to see them. You see, he was one who used his eyes to see or used writing to see. You know, he needed more, okay? But this method kind of limited the type of input that you were supposed to be using, um, right? Uh, some of the ideas that, that are listed here uh, in this text here by Brown. Uh, new materials are presented in dialogue form. Um, you had to mimic or memorize uh, the sets of structures. Structural patterns were taught using repetitive drills. Uh, they used a lot of tapes. They used uh, a great attention to pronunciation. So it was all audio and lingual. Listening and speaking, listening and speaking. Uh, and again, it, it got you so far, but it didn't get you to the higher levels of language, uh, language learning, language acquisition. 
another method that came out um, a little uh, after that was uh, community language learning. And uh, community language learning, although it did stress uh, the oral as well, it also stressed uh, the concepts of feeling good and trusting and that you wanted to have a low affective filter so that you could learn. And the belief was that second language learners would only be able to learn when they felt comfortable, when they felt relaxed, when their filter was low. Okay, well, we want to maintain a low affective filter. I, I would agree that we do. Actually, that we want to keep it low, maybe I wouldn't say that. We want to keep it low enough so that people aren't afraid or frustrated, or but we don't want to keep it so low that there's no no drive to become better. Um, you know, I don't know if you've ever been in a class where you were so bored because you understood everything that you actually got a bad grade. Uh, I have. I've also been in courses that were just so way above me that I couldn't understand what was going on, and I also got a bad grade. So I want to have it a happy medium. I want to be able to challenge them, but I don't want to over-challenge them um, so that the affective filter goes up. Now, all that being said, this whole idea of Koran's uh, uh, community language learning, I have a friend uh, in, uh, in Japan that I met. He's from Nepal. Um, and I was teaching uh, an introduction to TESOL course. <laughs> and uh, at the beginning of the course, I said, okay, everybody tell me what methods did you learn, you know, language? You know, were you thrown into the environment? Did you learn from a book? You know, you know what, did you, what lessons did you... And they're all talking about these. Now, one, this one guy, he raises his hand and he says, I learned by the grandpa method. I, I went, excuse me, the, the what? He says, oh yeah, the grandpa method. Until I was five years old, I lived in Nepal and I spoke Nepali. And that's all. When I turned six, my family put me into a, a private school, and in that school, you only spoke English everywhere. So it was a boarding school. In class, you spoke English. In the cafeteria, you spoke English. In the hallway, you spoke English. If anybody was speaking Nepali, you got punished. And the principal had a series of, of uh, switches. You know what a switch is. a long, thin, reed-like stick. And, uh, and they, there was, they were graded. Some were smaller, and they got bigger and bigger and bigger. The biggest one was called Grandpa. And anybody who was caught speaking Nepali in school, they got hit with a switch. And uh, that's how he learned English. Now... Does that raise the affective filter? I would think so. But here's this guy living in Japan in a class where he's allowed to speak English, and his English is very good. In fact, you can barely tell uh, an accent that he has, uh, and only every now and again will he make uh, some type of slight grammar. He sounded very much like an American, like an English speaker. But he learned via the grandpa method, right? Definitely would raise the affective filter. So I look at this whole idea about keeping the affective filter low. Okay, I can understand this, and I wouldn't want it too high either. I, I actually think that way sometimes. But that doesn't mean that you can't learn, even with the grandpa method. <laughs> and uh, that's all we have uh, for this section here. We do have some questions at the end of this chapter that you're going to want to finish and fill out. Please bear in mind that next week you will have an exam on these first four chapters. So please be prepared. There's a lot of information in these. And again, if you do have questions or problems, please let me know. And I will see you online in email or on Skype. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.